All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Tuesday, June 11th study session. Calling to order this meeting, and we'll have our city clerk start with the roll call. Mayor Kaylee Clark. Here. Deputy Mayor Karen Howe. Here. Councilmember Amy Lamb. Here. Councilmember Pamela Stewart. Here. Councilmember Kent Treen. Present. Councilmember Sid Gupta. Here. Councilmember Roisin O'Farrell. Here. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Councilmember O'Farrell, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Great, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Gupta, would you please read our land acknowledgement? We acknowledge that we are on the indigenous land of Coast Salish peoples who have reserved treaty rights to this land, specifically the Snoqualmie Indian tribe. We thank these caretakers of this land who have lived and continue to live here since time immemorial. Great, thank you. All right, first up, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, um, first proclamation or only proclamation this evening, we have Juneteenth, Councilmember Lamb. This is a proclamation for Juneteenth on June 19th. Whereas Juneteenth commemorates the end of slavery in the United States, marking a significant step toward freedom and equality for black Americans. And whereas Juneteenth honors the resilience, strength, and cultural contributions of black Americans, acknowledging their pivotal role in shaping our nation's history. And whereas despite progress through civil rights advancements, we recognize the ongoing challenges and systemic inequalities that persist, emphasizing the importance of continued advocacy for justice and equality. And whereas reflecting on our collective history, we commit to fostering a future where black culture and communities thrive, celebrating impact on arts, science, business, and public service. And whereas Juneteenth serves as a reminder to educate ourselves, embrace unity, and renew our dedication to building a more inclusive and equitable society. Now therefore, the Mayor Kaylee Clark of Sammamish on behalf of the Sammamish City Council do hereby proclaim June 19th, 2024 as Juneteenth in September in, in, in Sammamish. Let us honor this day by reflecting on our progress as we acknowledge ongoing struggles and commit to a future of equality and justice for all. Great, thank you so much. Okay, our first presentation is with Rose and Reesh on the Fleet Electrification Study Update, Part 2. Good evening, Council Members. My name is Rose Weicker. I am the Sustainability Coordinator at the City. I am joined tonight by Rish Ukil, a representative from Makers Architecture and Urban Design, as well as Deputy City Manager Rachel Bianchi, and Director of Parks and Recreation Anjali Meyer, and uh, Superintendent of Facilities John Arnold. Tonight is the second of two installments for the fleet electrification study um, performed by makers. Tonight we are going to be going over the phasing strategy, investments, and public charging infrastructure. I'll let Rich take it away. All right, thank you, Rose. Uh, good evening, members of the council. I'm happy to provide the second installment of this fleet electrification study today. Um, as you recall, the last time we met, um, the last council session, we looked at the work that we were doing um, and reviewed the progress. So we walked, we, I walked you through them, the targets and the policy drivers. Um, the, what fleet do you have? And, and then we walked you through the draft electrification approach as well as the costs. So today's um, agenda is to look at how do you face those costs and not to meet your commitments through 2030 and beyond. Um, and then the last piece is to, to be did a little bit of research on electric vehicle adoption trends and public charging in Sammamish. So we'll report out on that piece as well. A quick recap on the electrification strategy that we went over last time. So there were three things that we were looking at. Um, the first is your climate action plan. Um, so in 29 year, the, which is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the 2019 levels. So there are two um, 
to, um, targets to meet on that front, such as 50% by 2030 and then 96% by 2050. The other one that we are, uh, the target that we are looking at as part of this study was the 20% EV adoption by 2030 for, uh, in order to meet your commitment with the King County um, Cities Climate Collaboration. And then the third one was um, something that is being driven by the Department of Ecology's Clean Vehicles Program, um, which is essentially pushing for um, new light duty vehicles to be um, zero emissions. Um, currently as it stands, it wants to be, um, to, starting 2026, 30% of new light duty vehicle sales must be zero emissions in the state of Washington. Um, by zero emissions, we mean battery electric, um, fuel cell electric, and plug-in electric vehicles that can provide at a minimum of 50 miles of electric only range. So those are the three type of vehicles that the Department of um, Ecology is um, recommending that Washington State should have. Um, it's, it should be 35% in the next two years and then gradually increases. So by 2035, it's 100% of all new light duty vehicles falls within that zero emission category. So that's some, one of the things, one of the policies from the state that is driving some of the electrification in our state. So the electrification strategy for your city fleet, again, the priority is to invest where you need it to get ready for electrification. So as you recall, we went over two strategies, um, near term and the long term. So by near term, that is by 2030, it is essentially adding capacity at your sites. So City Hall, Beaver Lake Shop, and then um, phase one of MOC. Along with that, um, the, the strategy is electrifying uh, most of your light duty fleet that you can electrify, and for fleet that are not ready for to electrify by the end of this decade, is to convert them to alternative fuel. And then essentially monitor the market to see how the industry is developing, and do you have more EVs that you can purchase on the medium and heavy duty fleet. Beyond 2030, so that's your long-term strategy, is to electrify those fleet that you couldn't electrify in the, by the end of this decade. Uh, electrify them if they are up for replacement, assuming you know EV options or reliable EV options are available by then. And then before you do electrify, again, there are some uh, charger installations that are needed at your sites. Um, that is phase two of the build out at MOC, as well as at South Yard. We also looked at the cost last time. Um, you probably recall this donut. Um, as you can see, it costs 15.7 million to fully electrify your fleet. So this includes costs for fleet. So those are the two wedges that are in um, gray. So the darker one is the cost to electrify, cost, to cost for buying fleet through 2030, and the lighter gray is uh, purchase of fleet beyond 2030 and through 2050. The three greens that you see up here are um, cost on the charging infrastructure side, chargers as well as backup power, so essentially what is charging the vehicles at your properties. And then the two browns are expenses that are expected to happen um, throughout now. It's not a one-time expense, um, but through 2050. And again, those two are for software and maintenance for those chargers. Important to know there are some costs that are excluded and something that staff will follow up in the future is um, utility side upgrade costs. Future purchase costs for fleet that are being electrified through 2030. Cost for motors that do not have any reliable EV options available today or um, expected to be available in the next few years. Cost for R99 fuel cost, um, increased use of electricity for charging these vehicles. And then finally, any additional um, parking space that is required for fleet that may be growing in the future. So a quick recap, um, so that was a quick recap. Um, so now we look at the investment strategy. So on this slide, what you see is essentially those same costs, but spread over um, the years. So starting from 2024 all the way through 2050. Um, I'll walk you through this one slowly. Um, so what you see are essentially the, the grays are the purchase of fleet. Um, the, the, the greens are the cost for chargers, backup power, and infrastructure. And then the browns are software and the charger maintenance cost. And the black dotted line that you see is, um, that is typically how much the city of Sammamish has spent on um, acquisition and upfitting of your fleet um, over the last 10 years. So that average, that dotted line shows that average of, um, you have been spending around 430,000 a year on acquisition and upfitting of your um, fleet. So that is just there for comparison. Um, for the cost to fully electrify fleet, as you can see, it requires about five million by the end of this decade to meet your targets. Um, and that is um, around 700,000 a year by 2030. That includes um, around 1.4 million just in the next um, budget cycle, 25 to 26. 
And then, as you can see, it does require some investment um, on the front end. That is about 900,000 at City Hall, MOC at phase one, Beaver Lake shop, in order to get your sites ready, so, you're, so even before you purchase the vehicles. This graph that you see is based on a typical replacement cycle. Um, so that is subject to you know city budget levels, but also how well your vehicles are performing. And then also successful procurement of vehicles. And typically what uh, we have seen is that one year or more delays are um, has been standard or typical, especially in the last few years. Um, the, we do not assume any delay or early replacement of fleet except um, in the 2040 or beyond. And as you can see from the graph over there is um, after 2030, um, there are two major investments, that is um, in charging infrastructure investment in 2032 and 33, um, and also in 2035. And these are for those charging infrastructure at, uh, B at MOC phase two, as well as South Yard. After, beyond that, essentially this typical spending, so we've tried to reduce your spending levels and which probably requires some delay of fleet, but again, that is beyond 2040, so not in the front end. I think a pause here in all, if you all have questions for me. Council Member Stewart. Yeah, um, one question I have yeah. is, uh, it's my understanding that Washington State asks us to include a uh, social cost of carbon. And so has that been factored in when we look at our average costs for our fleet today? And I think the going rate is $78 per metric ton. That has not been factored in. I'm sorry? That has not been factored into the costs. Yeah. Okay, and then when you talk about the, um, the uh, infrastructure costs for our um, light duty vehicles, right? Like all the cars that are currently parked down in the garage, for example. Um, why do we use third party chargers as opposed to just installing like a 240 plug and getting our own, char our own chargers that come with, you know, they have software you can track by vehicle, how much is being used. You can time when, when things are charged and things like that. Is there some sort of savings by using a third party as opposed to just a, an over the counter, for lack of a better term, charger? I'm gonna ask John to come up and speak to why we use the infrastructure that we do have. So while he's doing that, I also just wanna mention on this slide, the known unknown costs, right, for the utility side are not factored into this slide as well. So I just wanna make sure we're all being very transparent here. So thanks, John. Hi, John, thank you. Uh, so the advantage to using a third party is uh, mainly for managing the fleet. So we're able to accurately gather data on how much the fleet's actually being used, what we're actually charging for all the vehicles. Um, and then the other advantageous point of this is uh, usually with those third party or, or other um, charging stations, we're able to program those so that we're actually charging off demand mm -hmm. uh, or off peak hours. That's gonna save a lot of money by not having the charger click on until later on in the night. And do we pay the third party rates for the electricity when we use those? As opposed, so if I charge at home, right, I pay about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. If I charge at, I won't name the company, but if I charge a particular company, it's about 48 cents a kilowatt hour. So we set the rates. So, so we uh, set the rates for yeah. the charge point chargers yeah. so the, down in the The in two the vehicles down there that are getting charged mm -hmm. that the city has um, have a zero dollar bill. So the only thing we're paying is what the electric meter is actually sucking from Perfect. PSE right now. Okay, cool, so. thank you. Councilmember Gupta. Yeah, thank you. Um, and in the uh, at the bottom of this slide, it mentions uh, this excludes the cost of additional dedicated parking space for the fleet. Is that additional parking space influenced by electrification, or is that just parking additional parking as the fleet would grow uh, at a certain baseline? As the fleet would grow. So it's not influenced by electrification. No. Okay. Great. Thank you. I think that's it for now. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Just a quick note, if I may, before we move on. Um, for those that don't know, the MOC stands for the Maintenance and Operations Center. Uh, I know we're uh, sometimes we're fairly used to using acronyms, but I think it's helpful context uh, when we have these kinds of discussions to, to uh, spell those out or say those out as it were, so thank you. 
So this final slide, which kind of bookends the fleet electrification study portion before we look at the public um, segment of this study. Um, so this slide talks about the emission reduction. So have you, after making all those investments, been successful in meeting your targets and also the policy drivers. So the blue on this um, graph that you can see is the, the city fleet's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, up there on the top that you can see on your top left is the 2019 emissions. So that is your baseline. Uh, important to note that in 2023, your emissions were a little bit higher. That's because you have a little bit more fleet, about a dozen more fleet than 2019. So uh, which is why your emissions are a little bit higher, but the study is estimating or your climate action plan is from the 2019 baseline levels. So as you see, um, the, the emissions are dropping, but at the same time, the, the black line that you see, that is the EV. So that is EV as a percentage of your total fleet. So as EVs go up, your emissions drop. So and in 2030, so that is your first milestone year, which you can see two circles up there. Um, so that talks about 50% emissions reduction by 2030. So that is being met. And then um, the exceeds 20% EV adoption. So that's your K4C. Um, commitment that is also being met or exceeded in this case. Um, moving forward in a few years, what you can see is 100% of your fleet is zero emissions um, light on the light duty side. So that is in alignment with the, the Department of Ecology's Clean Vehicles program. So um, that is also something that you are following here. And then um, thinking far ahead into the distant future, 2050, again, this exceeds the 96% reduction goals uh, for your climate action plan. Any questions? Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, um, and this is probably more for uh, Rose and Rachel. So this is awesome that we will meet or maybe even exceed our 50% for the fleet, but we have a goal of reducing 50% overall for the entire city, including our community, right? Not just our city stuff. So. This is awesome, but I don't know that we have other plans for all the other areas with greenhouse gas emissions where we're necessarily gonna meet the 2030 goal. So it almost feels like we need to see the overall plan and say, hey, some things might take even longer for us to see the reduction. So can we accelerate the fleet stuff to help counterbalance, et cetera? So this is very exciting and I really love this, but I do think we need to see kind of that overall plan to understand if this is enough or if this is a, a lever that we can pull and while it may cost us more money, it's at least a lever we can pull to accelerate reductions here where we might have to take longer in other areas. Does that make sense? I, I completely hear what you're saying, Council for Stewart. I think the issue here though is how much GHG, the city as an organization, actually produces versus the broader mm -hmm. city. And yep. it, those numbers are significantly out of balance, as Understood. you know, yeah. right? So I don't think that there really is a situation whereby without significant change, you know, within our community, um, we meet the 2030 goals, even just within what, what we have control over, right? So that's where we really have the work of the St Sustainability Commission to be working with their you know, friends and neighbors to change hearts and minds and heat pumps and that sort of thing. So I, I think you'll be excited about the next little topic that talks about EV adoption in the city of Sammamish because I will just spoil the plot and say that we are a leader probably in the yeah. country uh, yeah. for that. So Yeah, 98075 used to have the highest. I don't know if it still does, but it used to, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, so this is an exciting topic. Um, so public charging uh, and EV adoption trends in Sammamish. Uh, before we dive into Sammamish, I just wanted to highlight uh, what's happening in the country and even in the world. So as you probably heard that 2023 was a banner year for EVs, not just here, but across the world, most number of EVs were sold. Um, if you just look at the US, 1.2 million were sold last year. So the first time it crossed that 1 million mark. So uh, there's been great progress. A lot of people are buying EVs in the country. Uh, however, the, the percentage of EVs sold as, as a percentage of all the vehicles that were sold in the US was 7.6%. So that's actually quite low compared to what analysts were predicting only a few years ago. So it hasn't gone up um, as everybody expected. There has been a slowdown. A lot of people are buying hybrid vehicles and not just EVs. Um, the sales in Washington state has surprisingly been a little bit less, 5.6%. Uh, so again, that's also something that nobody predicted would be lower than um, the national average. 
Uh, however, in the Seattle metro area, we have seen a lot more EVs. 23% um, of new cars that were registered in the Seattle area were EVs. Um, that is the sixth highest in terms of metros in the U.S. So outside of California, this is where most EVs are being sold um, or registered in terms of new cars. One of the reasons um, EVs are being, you know, a lot of people are buying EVs is the average price of EVs have come down a lot. Um, today, across the board, they are um, costing around $60,000 which is um, just about 3,000 more than their ICE counterparts. Um, and um, research, good research by the International Council of Clean Transportation, they are suggesting that future EVs, they would be price comparable, could even be lower than their ICE counterparts as demand increases. However, if you do look at different segments of the market, the mass market segment, um, the vehicles are more costly, about 18% more costly um, as compared to their ICE counterpart, or ICE in this case is internal combustion engine or typically fossil fuel driven vehicles. Um, so the mass market vehicles are obviously more expensive, but um, luxury cars are pretty much price comparable. They are slightly higher, but you know, 0.4% um, is pretty much the same. So that's an interesting trend before we even dive into the mamish. Any questions on the national or global EV development? All right. So this is the EV adoption trends for Sammamish. So this is uh, data from the Department of Motor Vehicles um, starting from Jan 2020 through um, December of last year. Uh, the graph that you can see, um, the I guess it doesn't show up properly, but the lightest shade of gray that you see, this is all the new cars as well as renewals in the state of Washington, sorry, in, in Sammamish, uh, the three zip codes. And the lightest shade of gray is the internal combustion engine or the fossil fuel driven vehicles. Um, the, the second kind of middle shade of gray kind of looks like a shadow on that graphic. That is actually hybrid electric vehicle. Um, then the kind of a dark line that looks like a border, that's plug-in hybrid vehicles, and the yellow is battery electric vehicle that is fully powered by um, battery. So what you can see over there is um, EVs obviously did make up a small fraction in January of 2020. They have gone up quite a bit, especially in the last year. Um, not just battery, though, hybrid vehicles, as I mentioned, they have also gained popularity or resurgence in the last few years. Um, if you just look at new car registrations um, in Sammamish, 29% of the new cars were a battery electric vehicle. So as Rachel was pointing out, um, the city is actually a leader in the country. So as you can see, it's leading not just the state, the nation, but also Seattle metro area. So one of the highest EVs were bought last year in Sammamish. If you just look at what um, vehicles are registered in Sammamish from the battery electric, 75% of them are Tesla. Um, and again, 25% are also registered are luxury cars. Uh, it's, I know, uh, it's important to highlight that because manufacturers typically will dictate charger compatibility, whether you're charging at home or whether you are um, charging at a public station. So that is important to highlight and we'll get to that um, in a few slides. But before we go there, any questions on adoption? Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, so does this chart show total vehicles or just new vehicles purchased in that? Um, it, it's a total of new, new registrations and renewals. So like every month we have 5,000 new vehicles registered? Re uh, including renewals. Inclu oh, including renewals, okay, yes. thank you. So it's the yeah. total, total vehicles. Correct. So that's, uh, it's also interesting to see how the total number of registered vehicles in the city changes. Any other questions? Um, so look, talking about charging trends, again, this is a segment of the industry that is kind of changing uh, similar to the vehicles as well because they have to go hand in hand. Um, uh, last few years has seen a lot of rapid e evolution in this industry just in the charging segment. A um, lot of sm smaller um, scrappy startups, I could say, um, they consolidated in the last few years. Legacy energy companies, they also purchased a lot of them. There's also been government funding. So um, this industry is changing probably faster than the vehicle market itself. Um, something happened, something significant happened in late 22 or early 2023 is the, um, the Society of Automotive Engineers, they standardized um, the North American charging standard. Again, it's called NAX. And again, the reason there were a lot more industries, everybody had their own charging system. It was confusing to charge at home, but also publicly. So that standardization was important and one of the significant developments that could probably help the market. 
So that NAX is essentially the charging connector system um, that was developed by Tesla. Again, so that's why the manufacturer is important because that is the standard that vehicles will be charged in the future. Uh, most mod automakers last year, they committed to um, switching to that NAX connector system on their vehicles or having the inlet on that vehicle um, compatible with NAX starting next model year. So most vehicles starting next year um, will be NAX compatible or can be charged on a Tesla charging system. The International Energy Agency um, also did some research around, um, you know, what what kind of chargers are, or what is the trajectory of chargers, and what they found is that chargers is likely going to grow a lot. Today, there's approximately four million public chargers, or total chargers, uh, expects it to go to 35 million by end of this decade. So that's a steep jump, but importantly, what they're also predicting is that 80% of that charging is going to happen at home, so not at public places, but at home. I just thought this would be a good opportunity for Rose to tell you all how many conversions we've had uh, just this year, according to permits. Yeah, so we asked the permitting department to pull all of the EV home home installations um, so far through ju June 1st of 2024. Um, so this is, oh, it looks like this is actually from all of 23 through 24, um, so about a year and a half, we had over 500 chargers installed. So that was 623 permits issued and 552 of, there's no, there's no slide for this. This was just data that came in in the last week. Um, so 623 permits issued and 552 of those permits have been finalized. So over the last year and a half, we'd, we've had over 500 home installations for charging. All right, uh, so switching gears to um, public charging and what do you have, um, and we didn't just look at Sammamish, but we also looked at neighbors, um, your neighbors, Redmond and Issaquah, because people do often drive to their neighboring cities for charging or for any other commercial purposes. And uh, what you can see on that map is the commercial zone. So typically that's where you would find a public charger. So all those black or dark gray dots, um, those are actually level two chargers, so the slowest chargers that are out there. Um, there is a wide distribution, distribution, as you can see, not just in Sammamish, but also in Redmond and Issaquah. And 80% of them are operated by ChargePoint. Again, they are the leader in the public charging system. They used to operate a different connector system, but they've also committed to switching to NACs, or they have to, because that is, the, that is becoming the standard. Um, there's also two Tesla superchargers, and again, um, as you can see, the most of the people in Sammamish do drive a Tesla, so the Tesla supercharger system has been a big boon, especially um, the one that was installed in Sammamish Highlands. They are higher capacity uh, installed, I believe, in February or March of this year, so very recently. Um, there was already um, some more um, superchargers at the Issaquah Fred Meyer just across the um, city line. Why this is important? Because um, they are compatible with Tesla, Ford, and Rivian. Essentially, those three manufacturers make up 80% of the battery electric vehicles in Sammamish registered today. Um, and in the future, they will be 100% right because of the standardization. Additionally, there are more fast chargers, um, not in Sammamish, but in Redmond and Issaquah, as you can see, they are different manufacturers, um, but um, they're also available for the public. Any questions on public charging? Uh, Councilmember Gupta, um, what are the what is the difference in charge time between an L two and L three um, charger? So the level threes can essentially charge um, from zero to hundred percent, or I should say twenty percent to hundred percent within like fifteen minutes to thirty minutes, depending on how much charge you have, what is the you know battery capacity, um, etc. And then level t level twos are um, essentially what you would for overnight charging, so anywhere between six to eight hours for that same battery. And level ones are even slower; um, that would be you know almost fifteen hours. And um, I, th I think this was mentioned earlier, but I just wanted to confirm that um, is if you charge at an L2 station, um, is there an is there like a surcharge for the electricity? Are you paying more than you would pay if you were to charge at home? It would it would be a little bit of a cost, yeah, okay. cost increase. Yes. Okay, um, it might be on the next slide, but I think it talks about um, low usage of the L2 chargers. So I wonder if. You know, we, if we want people to use more public charging, um, 
or you know get better value out of what we've installed, maybe it's worth reducing that to at cost. You know, I can't imagine that there's all that much revenue being generated. Um, so just a consideration. I, I think if we move to slide three, I think, or sorry, sorry, the next slide, L2, L3. Um, I think that the issue here is really that the, the information is showing that people who have EVs in Sammamish have the infrastructure at home or have the ability to use the Tesla superchargers or the other ones that are available and that for now, right, as we continue to monitor, that may not be the place that we wanna be putting city resources as we're looking at our electrification strategy, but the broader, you know, what can we do with our fleet, right? So I think that's the, the point of this slide at the end of the day. But we will continue to monitor the chargers we have here, the chargers at the Y, that sort of thing to see if there's any change. But right now we're just not seeing a market. Deputy Mayor Howe. Uh, my question is an infrastructure question just in terms of, is there a way to upgrade an L2 or do you have to just take it out and put in a different type of charging infrastructure? Y you might have to um, take it out depending on the size of the conduit. Okay, okay, thanks. Councilmember Stewart. Okay, first of all, where do we have 22 L2 public chargers in Sammamish? I would love to get more details on that. Um, I mean, I think it's great. I'm just not aware of all, of all those locations. Um, I will say, uh, given the stats, right, the 80% uh, of people will charge at home, um, and you know, not just in Sammamish, but that was, I think, a general stat. Um, to me, that's all the more reason why we should consider looking at our um, building code and potentially amending the number of uh, charging compatible spaces for multifamily. Um, I think that again, from a from a equity perspective and a practicality perspective, uh, folks who live in multifamily are going to have to use public chargers more than at home unless we change that building code, right? Um, currently, I think the building code only requires like I forget the numbers, I think it was 25 or 30% of spaces be charging compatible. Uh, and that's not even gonna meet the number of, the percentage of EVs that we predict we'll have. Um, so I know that was something that was submitted to the city from People for Climate Action asking that we look into that so that as we build out multifamily structures, more of those spaces can be compatible. And I think we should ensure that they are able to be charged for the residents utility rates as opposed to the third party rates. Because again, right now, third party charging is about four times more expensive than when you uh, charge at home. Um, and it's almost to the point where it only barely makes electricity less expensive than gas uh, with the uh, sort of the retail rates on the third party chargers. So I would love to see us do that. Um, thanks. Councilmember Lamb. So it says that the um, utilization rate for the chargers at City Hall and the Aquatic Center is low. Is it because of the time it takes to charge? It's basically overnight to 80%? We, we haven't done any deeper analysis um, for that City Hall. Um, it wasn't really part of our scope, but what the data is showing uh, for the last one and a year and a half at the City Hall, and I think uh, for the last six odd months for the Aquatic Center is overall the utilization is a lot low that um, that if you want to like add more charges, level two or level three, then it obviously requires a separate study to understand like why the utilization is low. But definitely the, the data is saying that the rate is low and you know, if you should not you know, install a charger unless you know, there is sufficient demand. Okay, so I mean, there is a time difference. I'm just gonna assume that yeah. the reason people aren't gonna charge at, the, at City Hall is because they have to leave the car here overnight. I mean, Correct. that's kind of, uh, I would assume that. Um, so then the next line suggestions for the city is to monitor the city hall chargers and evaluate adding level two or fast chargers. Um, there's a huge cost difference between level two and um, the fast chargers to install. It's from like 5,000 for L2 to 50,000 up to 125,000 for, for a fast charger. Um, why would the city consider, I mean, it would be great to ask to, to install fast chargers, but it sounds pretty cost prohibitive and we would still consider that. 
I would, uh, if I may, Rish, um, that is more of a potential future suggestion. So if the technology were to improve and the market rate were to come down, or if we were getting feedback from residents that there is high demand for these chargers in addition to the superchargers that already exist and some of the public charging that's available, um, it's, it's not a must, it's a theoretical future okay, option. Great. Thank yeah. you. <clears throat> is Sammamish Highlands Mod Pizza right next to there? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I thought the Highlands was out by Brown Bear. Okay. We've all well, learned something I won't fight from Reesh about the, the, the name of that shopping center. It's, the, so. it's not a pure. <laughs> okay. Next, because their Tesla jokes. email says, congratulations, Sammamish, you got nine new stalls. But then like the photo, I can only count eight and you put eight. So I assume it's eight, yeah. but they just, it's yeah. On the website, it's eight though. Yeah, uh, I don't yeah. know the email they sent. It was like nine stalls, but I'm like, they're literally only eight. <laughs> okay, so next to Mod is the Highlands. Awesome, Correct. thank you. Th they were also looking at uh, Pine Lake Shopping Center area as another place for a second one. I, I think we all know that there's been some changes at, at that company that may or may not be then changing again. So I wouldn't be surprised, frankly, if we get another uh, pod of, of fast chargers down there. Eight. We'll, we'll suggest nine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Give me a story. All right. So um, just a reminder to council that we did uh, send out a comprehensive Q&A following the first installment of this presentation and then also addressing some follow-up questions that had come through via email from multiple different council members. Um, so. If there's additional questions, please send them our way and we will answer them in a similar manner. Um, but as a reminder, this study is meant to be kind of a snapshot in time. This is the state of the city right now and this is the current technology that's available to us and the recommendations for phasing based on the information we have today. Um, as we've learned, this is a rapidly evolving and continuously developing industry, both on the charger and infrastructure side and on the vehicle side. Um, so our suggestions coming from this study, we're gonna be taking this information, or you as council are going to be taking this information as part of your budget process for 25 and 26. And then staff will be continuously evaluating EV and infrastructure options and working this into our capital improvement plans that we have coming up in the next couple of years and into the future. Um, and it will be part of the biennium as well as future year's strategies, so. Thank you very much. Councilmember right. Lamb. <laughs> we were talking about small tools last time. Is that, uh, if we have questions, did you want us to send them or can we still um, ask questions here about those? I'll give you John's number. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. That small tools was a very limited portion of this uh, study, so we're happy to take questions, but you know, it may be better if you were to send them over email so that we would have time to respond to them because it was a very, very slim portion of this whole overall effort. Okay, so the preference is for us to email the questions? That would be okay it, to get better answers. <laughs> okay, thanks. Councilmember Stewart? Yeah, I would just uh, ask as we look at the um, sort of the cost benefit analysis, if we can add in those social costs as the state recommends when comparing, you know, sort of ICE vehicles, et cetera, because that is one of the recommendations, right? You can't really do a, a cost comparison um, without factoring those other costs in, right? The, the, the cost of carbon is not just how much it costs to buy the gas, right? It's the, the cost of the pollution and how much it will cost us to clean that up if if we don't do that. So I would love to see as we look at the budget and how we're, you know, comparing, you know, purchasing another, and I know you guys are looking at how when things come up for, you know, uh, the end of life and we wanna replace them, replacing them with EVs, but I just think whenever we're gonna show that cost comparison, it's really important to factor in all of those sort of opportunity costs um, and not just compare a straight up sticker price. Um, Councilmember Stewart, can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Um, you're asking for uh, the social cost of carbon in future projections, or are you asking us also to take a look back? No, at I the think it's social? just as we go forward, right? Like okay. when we're doing a cost comparison and we say, I'm going to make up numbers because 
make easy math. It's gonna cost us $20,000 to buy an EV, but it would only cost us $10,000 to buy an ICE vehicle, right? And so it's gonna cost us 10,000 more, but it's not really a straight up 10,000 because by buying that ICE vehicle, we're not factoring in the, that, social, that social cost of carbon is there to say, hey, if you buy another ICE vehicle and you're producing that carbon, we're gonna have to pay $78 a metric ton to clean that up some other way. Right, so you have to factor those costs in. And th there is a um, guidance uh, from the, I think it's the Department of Commerce on how to factor that into your, your cost benefit analyses. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> and I think I only had one other thought, if anyone else has anything. Um, Rish, I think, well, this is something for you to think on. <laughs> uh, I Yeah, I think the thing is love electrification, and then I always think about let's say climate change is real, everyone. <laughs> um, and we have everyone getting air conditioning, everyone getting electric cars. So how, who, how, how what is that cost of elect like electricity going to be? Who's gonna fix that? How will we have enough? Are we gonna do rolling blackouts? Just some future thoughts. I'm just, I don't know, these are things that keep me up at night. Yeah, it's something probably best answered by the utility, right? Uh, by the utility. The utility, yeah. Puget that's probably, energy. I was gonna say, or just policy makers, yeah, yeah in general. No, it's I was just question. curious, because I, it, like you said, we're going to pay more for that infrastructure from PSE, but yeah. like, how will they, I'm just like, what is the cost to make this electricity? What are we damaging by making the extra electricity? Like, what's the offset? I just don't know. That's a great question, uh, Mayor Clark. I, I'd like to just uh, mention the sustainability commissioners have had very similar questions. We have taken these presentations to the commission as well. Um, we did give them a brief introduction for the first one and we'll be bringing the second installment to them on Thursday. Um, we also do have a representative from Puget Sound Energy coming to speak to the sustainability commission about exactly that on Thursday, which is, we have these ambitious electrification goals and strategies, and if we were to electrify everything right now, could PSE support that with their grid? And the short answer is right now, no. Um, so they are working in tandem with all of us on our electrification, working to support and um, improve the grid accordingly. Um, but if you're interested, feel free to tune in to the Sustainability Commission on Thursday. No, that makes sense. I'm yeah. not saying the costs outweigh the effects, obviously, yeah. but I'm like, holy cow, how is this? I don't, it's a tall order. Electricity is magic to me. <laughs> um, so I'm like, there's gotta be offsets somewhere. Councilmember Stewart? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and, uh, and certainly something to ponder. One, I would say I would love it if that was actually our problem, if we actually thought we were gonna like blow out the grid tomorrow. But I don't think any of us have plans that we can actually execute on to make that happen. The other part is um, that's where I think that uh, community programs like I increasing solar, right? Um, the more solar we create again during the day when people are running their uh, air conditioners the most, the more we can help to offset that. Um, there's also just the basic, even if we didn't electrify everything, our electricity, our electrical grid needs to be upgraded, period, full stop. Like it is one of the oldest pieces of technology in our country and might even be considered a national security risk in its current form. So that needs to be upgraded anyway. So maybe this is the impetus to do it. And then there's technology for all of these electric vehicles where you can actually have your electric vehicles be part of your electric grid, right? They are, most new vehicles now are bi-directional in terms of their charge. So you can actually charge your, things at your house from your car and things like that. So there's plenty of technology out there. So I would say the, the onus is on policymakers at the local and state levels to really work together and put things in place because we have the technology, to quote the $6 million man, we have the technology, we just have to have the political willpower to go and, and make it happen. Yes, I would like to clarify, I'm, I'm not saying that I do not have the political, uh, oh, anyway. I'm just saying in general, all of us. But that's really great to know the PSC will be there. That'll be super good to watch afterwards because I, I won't tune in. I mean, you know, but it'll be really good to watch afterwards. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and then you already gave our next steps. And I think we're good, if, unless anyone else has any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Rish, for being here. Thanks, Rose. Thanks, Rachel. The th uh, three R's. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, Mike is up. 
And Mike, is Joe online? Awesome. All right, so next up is our 2024 community survey results. Great, thank you, Mayor Clark, and good evening, Council. Mike Sugg, Supervising Management Analyst. I'm joined on the line by Joe Delolio, and uh, we are excited to be here tonight to present the results of the 2024 community survey that just closed last month. Joe and the rest of the team at Polco have been uh, working hard to compile and summarize the data for us, and the result is outlined in uh, the report that's exhibit one in your packet this evening. Uh, to go along with the written report, there is an online dashboard that uh, will form the basis for the city's dashboard that we'll use to report pro progress on council's goals, as we have talked about in previous council meetings. Um, Joe will speak a little about this digital dashboard later in his presentation, and uh, we'll be working to integrate that into the city's website uh, for public viewing. And with that short introduction, I will go ahead and turn it over to Joe. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mike, for that introduction. Um, hopefully everybody can see my screen sharing there. Uh, and once I get through this introduction, I think I'm going to turn my camera off, so I apologize in advance. I'm getting a notification that I have poor internet connection. So um, with that, I, I just want to say that thank you so much for having me in this evening to uh, the mayor and member of, of the council. And I'm very excited to share a summary of the findings for the Sammamish uh, National Community Survey. And before I begin, I'd like to uh, thank my coworker, Stephen Vickers, who was the main project manager on this important project. And, and certainly I'd like to thank um, uh, Mike Sag for being our primary contact throughout this iteration of the NCS. His input was um, um, much needed for uh, the successful completion of this project. With that, um, I will move into a little bit of the background into who we are. Uh, so Polco's online community engagement polling platform provides information tools for local government and other public sector leaders. And now hundreds of organizations nationwide use Polco for strategic planning, budgeting, and empowering resident voices. Uh, we work to make civil verified community engagement online not only possible, but accessible. Uh, along with that, National Research Center is the research arm of Polco. Uh, NRC has, uh, at Polco um, has been the premier provider of survey services to local government for the past 30 years. And um, we do also have longstanding relationships with both ICMA and National League of Cities and, and many other institutions. And we work closely with um, the engaged local government leaders, uh, Alliance for Innovation, and have economic partners uh, such as the American Association for Public Opinion Research, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, as well as the Cooper Institute at Stanford University. And before we dive into results, I wanna emphasize that there are a variety of ways that these results can be used. And most commonly, the jurisdictions that we work with use their survey data to monitor trends in resident opinion over time, measure government performance and ratings of public trust um, to help inform budgeting processes and strategic planning. And our results allow you to benchmark your community's specific characteristics and services uh, against those same characteristics in other communities in our benchmarking database. Our hope is that with these findings um, as presented, it'll spur ideas where we could dig in a little bit deeper. And the National Community Survey, or the NCS, as I'll count most commonly refer to it here, is a standardized five-page comprehensive survey uh, that allows municipalities to assess resident opinion about their community and local government. Now, the NCS focuses on the livability of Sammamish by categorizing survey questions into 10 main facets of community livability shown here. Uh, and these are the areas uh, as identified through extensive survey research as those being most vital to creating communities that folks want to live in. And um, I do wanna note that we cover a variety of different topics uh, underneath the umbrella of each of these facets. A number of these are areas that the city has direct control over. And a number of these are also areas that the city doesn't have direct control over. We ask questions in both of these uh, to make sure that we're getting a good view into the overall livability of Sammamish. Uh, 
Along with this, uh, finally, we do find that these facets tend to align well with different departments. So when different department heads are looking for the information most pertinent to them, uh, that's easy to find in the report. Looking at the methodology we utilize in this iteration of the NCS, all households uh, within Sammamish were eligible to participate in the survey. A list of all households within the zip code serving the city were purchased based on updated listings from the United States Postal Service. And then using GIS boundary files provided by the city, addresses uh, were all each individually geocoded to make sure that they were within those defined boundaries. And we looked only at those addresses within the Sammamish city limits. Uh, from that uh, from that list of households that were within Sammamish, we have a proprietary um, way of randomly selecting those households, whereby each household has the known uh, a known probability of selection and the same probability of selection. And with that process, we selected 3,000 addresses uh, to receive the survey. So those 3,000 randomly selected households uh, received mailings beginning on March 25th, 2024, and the survey remained open for six weeks total. Uh, the first mailing was a postcard inviting households, the household to participate in the survey, giving them uh, some background information, inviting them to respond online. That was followed up uh, a week later containing, uh, with the mailing containing a cover letter uh, with instructions, some more background information on the survey as well as a physical survey questionnaire and postage paid return envelope. So all mailings included a web link uh, for residents to take the, the survey online, uh, and each uh, individual that received the survey had the ability to also take it uh, with that paper version of the survey if preferred. Along with that actual, the physical, the link uh, included on those mailings, we also do include QR codes uh, to further encourage participation and all follow-up mailings ask those who had uh, not completed the survey to do so, and those who had already done the survey to please refrain from completing the survey again. The survey was available in English, Hindi, Spanish, and simplified Chinese, and all mailings contained paragraphs in each of these languages instructing participants on how to complete the survey in their preferred language. So with this, we received back 322 total responses to uh, the random sampled portion of this survey. Uh, this correlates to about an 11% response rate um, with a plus or minus 5% margin of error. Uh, this falls right in line with what we would expect uh, for the NCS. Uh, we generally see a range of between 10% uh, to 18% for that response rate overall. So that falls again right in line with what we'd expect. And then we also shoot for uh, a plus or minus uh, six to 5% margin of error. So that 5% is actually a little bit better than what we would expect uh, on the NCS. Along with the randomly sampled survey, we did open up the NCS to the community at large. We, we wanted to make sure that all voices had the ability to be heard, whether they were in that randomly selected group or not. And uh, this opened up uh, for the final two weeks of data collection. To that non-probability, open participation survey, we received back 96 total responses. Uh, though we do focus on those uh, responses from the randomly selected survey. Uh, so the results that we see in uh, the presentation, as well as the bulk of the report, do refer back to that random sample. Additionally, we do reweight responses. And um, what we do is that we look at uh, the uh, demographic makeup of Sammamish as a whole, according to the U.S. Census, as well as the 2022 American Community Survey. And with that, we can consider some responses more than others to make sure that we're getting a good representative look into the demographics that make up uh, Sammamish as a whole. And one of the advantages that local government have in participating in our community surveys is the opportunity to compare ratings given by your residents to those from communities across the nation. Uh, this benchmarking was born out of the observation that there are just some areas that tend to score higher, uh, we'll say fire services, and there are some areas that just tend to score lower overall, we'll say street-related services. So instead of comparing these two unlike things together, we can instead look at fire services and Sammamish to other fire services and communities across the nation. And same 
with those street related services. Uh, at this point in time, we have more than 500 communities uh, within our benchmarking database, which comprises the voice of over 50 million Americans. Getting into an overview of our survey results, we do ask two questions directly related to those 10 facets of community livability. Uh, the first asks folks to um, identify the quality of those 10 facets of community livability. And here we'll see um, how we tend to report on this data, uh, showing the percent positive. So in this case, it's excellent or good. And that color designates that comparison to the national benchmark. Uh, the darkest green will be higher, the lighter color is similar, and the lightest green is lower than the national benchmark comparisons. And along with the quality, we do also ask folks to place an importance level on these 10 facets of community livability. And together, uh, we can, relatively speaking, identify any areas that are higher in importance and lower in quality. And this chart, which is included in the report, helps to visualize uh, any of those disparities. And, and this is just one of the ways to help us identify potential key findings looking through this data. Looking at these comparisons to the national benchmarks that I briefly touched on before, uh, to be considered higher than the national benchmark, an item, an individual item would have to be more than 10 points above the national average. And to be considered lower, it would be 10 points below the national average. So anything with that 10 percentage of a, the average, either above or low, is considered similar to the national benchmark. And one thing I like to consider as we go through this slide especially is that as much as I wish that we had each uh, community across the United States in our database, uh, unfortunately, we're not there yet. So when we're looking at these comparisons, it's really comparing Sammamish to other high performing communities, those that are looking to engage with their, their residents uh, and get that feedback. So with that in mind uh, and having those definitions in place, uh, the vast majority of items um, compared to the national benchmarks were similar. Uh, 27 received higher ratings and seven received lower ratings. And this being the, the third time that Sammamish has run the NCS, it does give us uh, the ability to look back at previous scores to see how things have changed individually in the community. Uh, with that in mind, compared to the previous iteration of the NCS in 2018, uh, 14 items received higher ratings, 71 were similar to the previous iteration, and 18 received lower ratings. And with that, we will jump into uh, some of those areas of greatest change. Uh, first, looking at those items that were higher than, than the previous iteration. And these are spread out across a number of different uh, facets of livability. You see the first few um, in uh, mobility with the ease of travel by car and traffic flow on major streets. Uh, from their uh, natural environment with preservation of natural areas and some managed open space as well as availability of paths and walking trails. On the flip side, uh, for those items that were uh, decreasing uh, from the 2018 iteration of the NCS, uh, we also see these spread out uh, across a number of different facets. Uh, some of these were in education, arts, and culture, um, including that first item there, uh, as well as the availability of affordable quality childcare and preschool. Uh, some were also in health with availability of preventative health services and availability of affordable quality health care. And we also saw public places where folks want to spend time. And before covering some of these key findings, I want to note that this is what stood out to us as survey researchers. And um, y'all being the experts of the community, I'm sure there are many, many other highlights to be gleaned. But with that, we're gonna start with our highest performing areas. First of which was natural environment. Nearly all items related to the city's natural environment garnered positive ratings, uh, and many scored higher than the national benchmarks. And this included air quality, cleanliness, overall quality of the natural environment, water resources, yard waste pickup, and recycling. 
and all garnering marks that were higher than the national benchmarks and scoring very high overall. Next, we have safety in Sammamish, and a majority of survey participants gave positive ratings to uh, feeling safe in their neighborhood during the day, as well in the city's downtown and commercial area during the day. Uh, similarly, roughly eight in 10 residents highly favored uh, the overall feeling of safety, ranking higher than the national average. And, and respondents gave high praise to their feeling safety from property crime at 80%, violent crime at 93%, uh, and fire, flood, and other natural disasters at 86%. Uh, these items were all on par with uh, similar communities. And, and uh, as we build up further uh, trend lines, we can continue to observe those and, and build that data. Next, we have parks and recreation in Sammamish. Again, a, a number of items in this facet were higher than the national benchmarks. Uh, this included the overall quality of parks and recreation opportunities, as well as the availability of paths and walking trails, uh, with approval with close to 90% of residents. High marks were also given to city parks, uh, while that was similar to the national benchmarks, or closer to about 8 in 10 uh, approved of fitness opportunities, recreational opportunities, and closer to that 7 in 10 recreational programs or classes, as well as recreation centers and facilities. Next, we have mobility. Uh, and assessments for mobility trended upward uh, compared to 2018 in many instances. This included traffic flow on major streets, uh, which increased by 27%. Ease of travel by car, which also increased by 27%. Ease of travel by bicycle, 10%. Traffic signal timing, 10%. And street cleaning, about 8%. And mobility services, including street cleaning, um, Sidewalk maintenance, street repair garnered positive reviews and scored higher than national benchmarks. And similarly, about seven in 10 residents also favored uh, the ease of public parking. Finally, we have inclusivity and engagement in Sammamish. And um, this was a first time asked uh, since the first iteration of the NCS. Uh, residents gave excellent or good ratings to making all residents feel welcome at 76%, taking care of vulnerable residents, uh, and having a sense of civic slash community pride. Uh, these items were all on par with the national averages, uh, and we will also be looking to uh, build up some more trend lines there where possible. Uh, attracting folks uh, of diverse backgrounds and valuing and respecting residents by, from diverse backgrounds garnered positive ratings from roughly 8 and 10. Um, which also scored higher than other comparison communities. And, and about 7 in 10 residents appreciated the openness and acceptance of the community towards people that, of di diverse backgrounds, and placing this also higher than the national average and holding steady from previous iteration of the NCS. Next, we'll look at a, a couple of those areas that may need a, additional focus. First of which is the economy in Sammamish. Uh, and although results indicated satisfaction with the overall economic health of Sammamish, uh, we did see some mixed results looking at those individual items that may uh, suggest room for additional focus. Uh, with this, uh, roughly one third of residents praise shopping opportunities, uh, vibrancy of downtown and commercial area, as well as a variety of business and service establishments. Uh, these did score lower uh, than the national average. Similarly, survey participants uh, gave excellent or good ratings to employment opportunities uh, at 25% positive, as well as the overall cost of living at 13%. When asked what impact the, the economy will have on the family income the next six months, uh, about one third of respondents gave favorable ratings. Uh, though this item did place higher than the national benchmark, uh, it did see a statistically significant decline from the previous iteration. I do want to note here that uh, these findings are reflected on ongoing national trends linked to affordability concerns and increased cost of living. And nearly all of the uh, projects that I've worked on personally, anecdotally speaking, um, have experienced um, a decline in not only the impact that folks felt the economy would have in the next six months, but largely on those items uh, asking uh, anything regarding affordability. And this includes the cost of living, availability of affordable housing, 
as well as some of those items within health and wellness, uh, asking about uh, uh, affordable quality care, uh, so on and so forth. So again, to help contextualize, this is something that we've seen on the national level. In addition to the economy, um, we also have education, arts, and culture in Sammamish. And statistically significant declines were seen in several aspects of this facet. This included the overall opportunities for education, art, culture, and the arts, opportunities to attend cultural arts and music events, availability of affordable quality childcare and preschool, and adult educational opportunities, as well as opportunities to attend special events and festivals. These were, again, all items that experienced a notable decline. Uh, we did also ask folks uh, uh, to place rating on community support for the arts, and we received um, positive remarks from about half of the community on that. In, in addition to the standard questions that we ask in the NCS, we do allow for uh, custom questions, um, of which we asked a few here in Sammamish, which we will cover. The first of which was how informed and or uninformed do you feel to implement sustainable practices in your home? Uh, we saw that most folks were somewhat informed um, with slightly less for that very informed. Uh, a lower proportion felt that they were completely uninformed or somewhat uninformed. So uh, a good level of folks that felt uh, they were informed enough to implement some of those sustainability practices our next question, how much of a priority, if at all, should the city of Sammamish place on each of the following sustainability efforts? And we saw strong support for a majority of these items that we asked. Uh, the strongest was for that waste reduction at nearly 90%, closer to 80% water conservation, tree canopy preservation, and renew renewable energy and sustainable uh, transportation. And we saw still a majority showing a priority for the next two items, although slightly lower with greenhouse gas emission reduction, as well as vehicle miles traveled per capita reduction. We also asked folks to, to indicate what degree they would support or oppose the city focusing on diverse and affordable housing options in Sammamish. And we saw a more equal distribution uh, on this question. Uh, certainly um, higher for those that support uh, with 34% strongly and somewhat support. Uh, although we did see a higher proportion in this question for those who somewhat oppose and those that strongly oppose. And asking folks um, that housing is largely driven by market forces, we asked them to indicate what extent they support or oppose the city taking each of the following actions to increase the diversity and affordability of housing in Sammamish. Again, here we saw more equal distributions uh, between those uh, that supported these options compared to those that opposed. Uh, those options that uh, garnered the strongest support were public land donations slash publicly funded projects, as well as regulatory mandates. And then we saw near equal distribution for those that supported or opposed developer incentive programs as well as transferring development rights from sensitive areas to appropriate planned uh, locations. Finally, um, when asked to rate how important, if at all, folks felt it was for the city to focus on each of the following in the next two years, uh, again, we saw very strong support for nearly all of these items, um, about nine and 10, ensuring responsible city spending, having a balanced budget into the future, and planning for long-term infrastructure projects. Uh, we saw slightly lower um, than nine and 10 for maintaining a high level of city services and closer to eight and 10, ensuring expensive infrastructure projects are financed over time. Uh, and then we saw that slight drop off to about six and 10, diversifying the city's revenue sources. And again, uh, looking at a summary of these conclusions, I, I do want to note that this is what stood out to us as survey researchers as being interesting. And there's many, uh, many other highlights to be gleaned from that data. And I do want to note um, that with Polko, we do have um, a tool called Track, um, 
that the city can use to help contextualize some of this data as it comes in. Uh, Track tool combines the, that resident sentiment that we uh, just were able to capture with the, the MCS uh, with uh, many different data points and that are publicly available all in one place. Uh, so we can take that resident opinion and help contextualize it into a more national level. And with that, I'd like to thank you again for having me in. And certainly I'd like to stop here for any questions. I'm more than happy to cycle through uh, any of the previous slides if you'd like to look at any of that data that we covered. All right, Council. What do you have for Joe or Mike? Uh, Councilmember O'Farrell. Turn my mic on first. Uh, Mike, I was going through the data on our packet, which was really informative. Um, and I was looking at um, the very first part about the quality of life, and it was asking about, you know, could you say, see yourself staying here, remaining at Smamish for the next five years, and uh, which was useful to know. And I just wonder, going forward in the future, when we, when we do this survey again, it would be useful, or if you're able to construct a question about seeing beyond, in long term, is a person likely to stay here, like beyond five years? Do they see this as a place that they want to grow old in and retire to and stay here as opposed to leave once the kids are done with high school? So I think that going forward, that might be some interesting information to have, just to kind of give us an idea of, of how people feel about staying here. Because I think that also goes to that whole question about inclusivity and engagement section. You know, if people are planning on staying here long term, maybe then they're more likely to get involved and volunteer and participate. And then as a result, you have a more richer community and a much more, um, you have a city and, and, and that community when people are here long term and they have roots. So I just thought that um, throw that out there as maybe a potential for um, a question maybe going forward. Um, I was kind of surprised when I looked at governance because that was part of the survey that was really interested in hearing what the what residents had to say about us. Um, and um, particularly about public information services, it seems like we went from 79% uh, to 69%. Um, and we have made inroads in terms of trying to get our information out there. We have a new website and we do coffee with council and we have our newsletter back up and running. I wonder, do you think, or is there a comment on, does it take time for those kinds of new things that we've introduced in say the last year or two to kind of bubble up into people, you know, consciousness and that maybe that's why we see, or have we any commentary on why we see that kind of decline? And will we see maybe an uptick in, on the next survey considering some of the things that we've done? Yeah, I think that's a great point, Councilmember O'Farrell, is that it will take a little bit of time to probably see those uh, the efforts that the city has made in terms of communication actually show up in our survey data. I would assume there's a little bit of a lag. I'd also say there's also the, the potential for um, uh, events and sentiment on the national level to kind of trickle down to the local mm. level, just trust in government um, across the board could it be affecting uh, people's trust in our public information services. So, um, you know, that's something that we could perhaps follow up with uh, Polko on to see if that's a, a trend they're seeing more nationwide. Um, because right. it, has been a, it has been a long leg, 2016 to 2024, and um, it'd be right. interesting to see uh, where those trends are coming from. Okay, a lot has happened. Um, yeah. I wonder as well, do we intend, or is it, um, when I look at the economic impact that we, part of the survey, um, I think that would be interesting information as well to share with our Chamber of Commerce if we do things like that, if they ask for that kind of information. Um, I thought it was interesting to see from the sustainability that our residents are really interested in finding out more about waste reduction. And I think that's, you know, would be an interesting comment as well to provide to, and then this whole survey information in general, I hope we're gonna trickle it down to our commissions and give them a presentation on this too. I think it would be interesting information for them to have. But to see what residents are really interested in from a sustainability point of view, that waste reduction, and that, because that's something I think you can, we all can do instantly and see and have an impact on. So I, th I thought that was, that was great information to get back. Um, and uh, I love to see, the rest of what I have to say are just kind of observations, that we obviously have an uptick in people who are cycling and walking. So our emphasis on kind of trails and connectivity, I think is right on. 
and also the uptake in public transit. And it's clear from the survey that people are looking for an improved transit option. And so hopefully, you know, 2025, when we have a new 269, that will have a better um, service, that that will help. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, the, um, it, it was kind of like the last section where they compiled all the questions. And one of the things that it seems that we're found wanting on, not only affordable preschool and childcare, but emergency preparedness. And I know that we're still working on that. So it, it felt to me, the results of the survey felt like that we are kind of on the right track. The kind of things that we're working on are what the community want us to be working on and the direction that we're going in on affordable housing, et cetera, et cetera. So it was, it was kind of, uh, confirmed to me and as well about our council goals that we are kind of reflecting what our community are looking for. So it was really good information and well presented. So um, so thank you and uh, hopefully we continue to do this going forward and then we share. I would really love to see that we share this information with our commissions because I think it would really help inform our work going forward. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, council member. I think that's a great suggestion to do presentations to the commissions because there's a lot of data in here that could inform their work. That's, that's spot on. Deputy Mayor Howe. Thank you. I just had a couple of questions. I just wanted to get a little clarity. Um, I believe that it was utilities that was highly rated. Do we think that um, in terms of importance, if I'm remembering the slide correctly, or do we think that the population is thinking internet? What utilities, or are they thinking water? or is it an amalgam? What's tricky about this is that given our constituency, you know, maybe in certain towns, they wouldn't think of internet right away, maybe, but I do. So I'm just kind of wondering where, where is this, you know, what do they mean by that when they're talking about utilities? Do we know? Joe, maybe I could hand this one off to you to explain what utilities includes. Yes, that's a, a wonderful question. Uh, and so it, those general questions do cover those 10 facets of community livability overall, um, although we do dive in deeper to those individual items. So uh, when we get that feeling for what folks are thinking of utilities as a whole, it would be encompassing water, internet, those other areas as well. Uh, and then once we get into some of those individual items, um, under the umbrella of utilities. Uh, this asks for affordable high-speed internet, uh, garbage collection, drinking water, uh -huh. uh, sewer services, stormwater management. And then we do also ask for uh, power utility as well as utility billing. So um, again, that, that first question is kind of that all encompassing before we get into uh, the more granular side of it. Okay. because. I also see that uh, that a community would be looking to a city to provide uh, utilities as being kind of a core service. And so being excellent at that would be a critical thing, a measurement. Um, the other question I had had to do with, um, are we scored more poorly in um, having events or opportunities for culture and getting together and ga ga gathering spaces and so forth? And I wondered how much of that was a likely outcome from pandemic because pre-pandemic, I think we had a lot of things going on. Then there was nothing. Post, things are just, they haven't ramped up in a lot of ways. And people haven't wrapped up, ramped up in their desire to attend necessarily everything either. So I was wondering what impact you thought um, the pandemic had with that particular statistic? Or do you think it was speaking to a different need that we're actually not addressing? Uh, I think yeah, a wonderful, good. oh, sorry, go ahead, Mike. No, Didn't go ahead, Joe. Anybody. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a wonderful observation. Um, I don't have necessarily the, the national data, unfortunately, for overall education, arts and culture. That's something that I could look into a, a little bit more. Uh, I do think certainly the way that individual communities um, have responded, not necessarily just from the local government standpoint, but also from uh, folks being comfortable with going out and interacting with these activities more, uh, has certainly changed. Uh, and it is, uh, I'd say, probably closer to those individual communities as well. So 
With that, I think it would be an interesting point for us to follow up a little bit more into. Uh, it could be from uh, the offering side, possibly communication side, uh, but also certainly I would say that the way that folks interact with these opportunities uh, certainly has changed post-pandemic, if I can go so far to say post-pandemic. Right. And the other question I have has to do with just every single question is broken up by demographic, correct? So if I wanted to go into more detail, I'd be able to say, for example, the question about, are you planning to stay for five years? I'd be able to look at the demographic and be able to say 55 and over, 65 and over. Yes. Yes, you are exactly okay. correct. Uh, we asked and uh, female, a few female. That, yeah, very helpful. And the other yes, part that I'd definitely. like to know is, and you explained this, and I think I just missed it. So if I could just get a little clarity, the the people that volunteered answers, the ninety six that volunteered an answer, did you say they did align with with the people you selected, or did not align in responses? That's a, a great question as well. Um, we do include in the report um, a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a waiting table. Uh, and that shows us right. uh, the folks that received the survey or responded to the survey to those that, um, the demographics that make up uh, the community overall. And with that, we were, there are some demographics that uh, we tend to hear from more overall. Yes, yes. Um, that tends to be those that are older in age, uh, usually white, uh, those who own it's their own homes. It's cues. Um, uh, so that's where that reweighting comes into okay. to fact. Um, so we don't want to change that data to the point that we're manipulating it, yeah. uh, but allows us to get much closer to those true demographic breakdowns uh, that make up Sammamish as a whole. So looking through that that um, demographic reweighting table, most of them are actually, we do hit that target number. Uh, a few of them will be off by just a few percentage points, and that's because we don't want to push that data too far. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Lamb. So I thought this survey was really great to see. You know, we hear people come to council and make comments, public comments. They'll write to council. We meet people at coffee with council, but you never really get a true pulse check on the community. And if we were to take um, the comments that we get from, you know, like I was just mentioning, it, it is very different than what the survey shows. And this survey shows um, we are on the right direction. Traffic isn't as bad as I tend to hear it is. Um, people support um, diverse housing and increasing housing affordability. So I think in general, I am pretty happy with the results that we've seen that, that's presented. Um, I just had a question regarding the open survey. Were, could, people, could people submit uh, survey repeatedly. A wonderful question. Um, so we have a, a, a few ways to help determine if folks have entered the survey more than once. And for the open participation survey, we do generally ask that folks register um, and create an account with Polco. And uh, that allows us to get a little bit of insight of uh, where, what part of the city that they live in. And so with that registration, uh, folks would only be able to respond once to the survey for that open participation element. Okay, because there was um, a distinct difference between the people that responded via the postcard versus the open survey, like definitely leaning more negatively. Um, for, I guess this is a question about the dashboard. So. Just as an example, if people, if we see that there's a pretty good support for the housing, housing affordability, um, that would make it on the dashboard. And would we um, provide more data regarding that? Say, you know, one of our council goals is increasing housing affordability. And so therefore we are showing measurables on how we are increasing housing affordability. And it's just not showing that 61% of people support it. 
Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Councilmember Lamb. I think the the starting point for the dashboard is to kind of reorganize this survey data under each of Council's goal areas. So that will be our, our first step. And then as Council directed us, we'll come back with one or two additional measurables for each Council goal area uh, before the end of the year. So we're gonna we're gonna start with the survey data and then we'll see you know what else those one or two extra things that we can layer in on top of those um, to provide a little extra context for the dashboard. Excellent, thank you. Councilmember Gupta. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, this was very informative. Um, I did have a question about the utilities. Um, I saw we had an 11% decrease. Uh, we Our quality seems to be pretty good, but um, from 2018, we had an 11% decrease in utility billing. And I wasn't sure, is that relative to cost? Is that relative to clarity on what people are being billed for? Um, what does that encapsulate? A, a wonderful question there. Um, utility billing uh, really, uh, I believe, is on the uh, ease of being able to um, pay the bills and access to that. Um, with that question, uh, folks may consider those different aspects. And um, so uh, really with that, as uh, that specific item um, does come up to the interpretation of uh, how the resident views that. Okay, thank you. And is that, um, I don't know if you have this information offhand, but is that reflective of a national trend of things getting more expensive so people are less satisfied with their utility billing? That's a, a wonderful question as well. Um, anecdotally, uh, I do think that it may have an impact on it. Um, I don't have the, the national data, unfortunately, to, to be able to support that outright, uh, though I do, would it, I would expect that um, anything regarding uh, the prices of things of affordability would have an effect with those national trends. Great, thank you. And I just wanted to um, echo Council Member O'Farrell. Um, it, it looked like in one of the slides that you presented, the largest gap we had between quality and importance was in transportation, while at the same time, the largest increases we had um, in terms of uh, satisfaction were, again, in transportation in terms of travel by car, traffic flow on major streets, uh, and paths and walking trails, uh, bicycle traffic. So it seems like we are in the right direction, uh, we're heading in the right direction, but we do need to continue to focus on connectivity uh, and multimodal transport. And one thing that really stuck out to me was our transit satisfaction is went from like 20% to 18%, sorry, 18% to 20%, which is lower than the baseline. And I think satisfaction with bus service quality was 30% down from 39%. Obviously, we've lost some routes in the city. So um, again, I think that highlights to me that we have we really have work to do in Sammamish, and this should be a focus for us going forward. Thank you so much. All right, Council, anybody else? Council Member Treen. Yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, well put out here. Um, thanks for our first statistically valid community survey. Appreciate that, uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, I think the f I, from, from reading all this, it just kind of highlights some stuff, but first and foremost for me, uh, I think the city needs to continue to work on and be a part of providing the safety. It's, it's really hard when you're that, as high as it's ranking here to improve that but it's also really difficult to maintain it. So, so the, um, the, the goals that the council has set uh, and the vision that we have for the community, I, I think is being reflected really well with this survey as far as the highest performing areas are the top priorities of the community. So to continue to protect our natural environment in Sammamish is something we should be doing. Uh, maybe the number one thing we should be doing, uh, my preference would be number one is safety. Um, so then that leads us to our parks and we have amazing parks, they're beautiful. Uh, we're continuing to develop our parks and we're also, I would hope that the council and uh, the community would support us in acquiring more land for parks. Uh, as the community grows, we want to be able to provide that kind of service and keep that as highly rated as it is. I think the trend that you saw there too about the traffic is 
because we've had this change since COVID in the, in the way people are working and how they're uh, operating either from home or have, I, I always call it uh, Monday light and Friday light. Uh, my commutes on Monday and Friday are way different than Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. So, so it, uh, we obviously are benefiting from that. I was hoping that would be the case so that we could, as a city, do a bit of a catch up as a young city. Uh, we have um, kind of, uh, I think, uh, former council members uh, have come and even expressed to us that we continue to kick it down the can down the road. And, and so it would be nice if some, at some point we take a stand and say, okay, we're, and I think we are actually, we're gonna have a transportation master plan out of this update. We continue to push our tips um, and, we, and we continue to look at ways to which we can uh, make uh, traffic flow on major streets an ease for the travel of our cars and of course safe. Um, the, the question I had, I was curious about because one of the things that I was talking about was the, you know, there was this percentage of community vibrancy or this vibrant shopping and downtown and employment opportunities were down in the 35, 33 and 25 uh, percent. And I was just wondering if that is that the majority of Sammamish residents do a lot of their shopping uh, in Issaquah or uh, on the way home from Bellevue or on their way home from Seattle. So I don't know if that's something that can be analyzed to see why were the percentages that low. I mean, we have good quality shopping here as far as food and I mean I purchased my gas here so it's kind of like you look at it as like okay so why what are we missing here or why is it so low so that's just that was my only other question that came up out of here thanks all right anybody else all good okay Mike so you have a dashboard coming Yes, we do. Awesome. We don't have a date yet for that, but um, yeah. now that we have the results, we're gonna be working on it. And are we using Joe's, or obviously it's not his, but the <laughs> the tracking that thing, or are you making, it doesn't really matter, I was just curious if that's what we're gonna use over time, is the Polco. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be using Polco's data. Um, the final form that it will show up in, I'm not, I can't say yet, but it will probably look similar to what Polco's putting out, just organized within council school areas. Awesome, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, on the front page. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be exciting. No, thank you. And thank you, Joe, for um, I think all the reports. I know Councilmember Lamb had some good questions that we got good reports and other. Like you said, the open survey um, it was interesting to read through. So, yeah, thank you for all of that. Great. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Joe. Thank you again for having me in, and I look forward to our continued partnership. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So now we have public comment. Uh, so we'll start in the room, assuming Mary has signed up, no? Okay, online, anybody? Per the reasonable accommodation, those who had pre-registered by three o'clock today, please raise your hand if you wish to give testimony. Mr. Stickney. Good evening, City Council. It's Paul Stickney, Sammamish. He enjoyed this evening's meeting. Lots of really great information on the two topics. Just a couple of brief comments on uh, both. I've been uh, doing some research and I'm sort of just getting started on this, but one potential solution as an infill for power or even um, a way to add power needed if if hydroelectric can't keep up with with the future needs for electricity is one of the small modular nuclear reactors. I tend to do a lot of study on topics. I have not done a lot of study on this. I just looked at it cursory, but a couple of interesting things. 
the amount of greenhouse gas emissions are one one hundredth from uh, a nuclear, and in general, they have far less environmental impact than high yield energy. So I'm just saying it's an interesting thing that could be coming. On the survey part, uh, appreciated all the uh, general data, have a deeper understanding of why that general part is in uh, play. Agree with Council Member O'Farrell and others who talked about having people ask if they're interested in staying longer term. And I think uh, another question for the future would be to ask people how do they feel about having different housing supplies and maybe have a few topics, kind of like there were 10 topics a couple times of how people felt about things. Maybe things could be, you know, for kids and future generations or for parents, or if there's unplanned or planned changes over life, or if you just want to downsize because the kids go, it would be interesting to kind of get a little more information on the stay aspect as to what life issues would one reasonably hope to be able to have in Sammamish as opposed to would they not be interested in that. So I just think a little more uh, clarification on some of the topics for staying. That's my comment tonight. And again, appreciate the meeting, consultants, real good overall presentations. Have a nice evening. Thank you. That's all for online public comment. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Okay, Scott. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Just a couple of quick items to follow up on the proclamation we had this evening. A reminder that Juneteenth is next Wednesday, June 19th. Um, a reminder that City Hall will be closed in, in honoring and celebrating the holiday. Uh, a couple other notes that uh, we wanted to mention is that the Juneteenth flag is flying above actually the front doors in City Hall next week. Um, it turns out that our flagpole only has spots for three, uh, and since it is Pride Month, the uh, Pride flag will stay up. But the Juneteenth flag is uh, on display uh, in a place that is highly visible, and so uh, we think it's a good alternative to that. Um, wanted to say thank you to everyone that came out for the Pride event last week. I want to say thank you to the Chamber and the Farmers Market for accommodating us and for all of our partners that came out and staffed the tables, in particular um, our students from our two high schools and their uh, Gay Straight Alliances to come out and join us. I thought it was a great event, and the feedback we got from the market and the Chamber is that um, they had really good turnout that day, so I think it was a real positive for the community overall. So I want to say thank you to all those that came out and joined us. Um, and with that, I think that's everything for me. Thank you. Awesome. Does anyone else have anything? Deputy Mayor Howe? I'll just mention very briefly that I was able to take a tour of the Plymouth Housing Project, which is around Eastgate. And it's part of Porch Light, which is the men's shelter, and low-income housing, and then the um, Plymouth Housing Project is a zero to 30% AMI. And I was drug in to take a look at someone's room because she was so excited about it. It had huge high ceilings. They are studio units. Mm -hmm. And she is thrilled, absolutely thrilled with what she has. Um, they're very simple, they're spare, and highly functional. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a new model that they put in play with a behavioral, um, counseling and as well as a, a, a nurse practitioner that's on site. In addition to having 24 seven uh, staff that live there actually at the complex as well. It is, it's a phenomenal, it is a phenomenal facility and it is such an opportunity to get people housed one human at a time. And I'm looking for opportunities to actually integrate that community into ours. So as we do different celebrations here, to make sure that they're aware of it, and that as they have transportation, wish the buses were better, but they do have some vans. Mm -hmm. You know, we're doing a party at, on the plateau with our celebrations on the 4th of July, things like that. That's the type of thing I wanna make sure that they feel included in and can participate in as neighbors. 
So I'll, I have some information. I'll be dropping in each of your mail slots to just about it. Thanks. Councilmember Lamb. I have a public issues committee meeting tomorrow and the main topics are the crisis care centers. There is a topic on the free youth passes, free transit passes for youth. And we'll be discussing the influx of um, people requesting asylum in the South King County cities, particularly Kent. Great, and then there's an E for on Thursday. Eastside Fire and Rescue meeting. Um, and then just lastly, congratulations to Councilmember O'Farrell and Councilmember Stewart for graduating your last children, right? Yeah. For high, Almost. Hopefully, <laughs> but Thursday, Thursday, hopefully they'll make it. They will. Okay, okay. Um, but congratulations to you both. That's very exciting. By hook or by crook. Yeah. They'll make it. They'll be gone, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Councilmember Gupta. Uh, yeah, just very quickly, we have an Eastside Transportation Partnership meeting uh, this Friday. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, safety through King County Metro, and WASDOT has uh, enhancing safety for all users. So we'll report back on that. All right, with that, if we have nothing else, uh, good night, everybody.